to recognize how the thief is able to um, keep your life from experiencing heaven on earth throughout the course of your days on earth is, is simply because the thief uses temptations in your life to divert you from finishing your sowing assignment unto God. Temptation is a seed blocking plan and plot so that you don't get to the harvest, so that you don't get to due season. Sowing was made for you to explore all of the pleasures of God. Sowing was made for you to explore all of his pleasures. Everything that would excite you, everything that would ignite you is in the seed. The Lord started teaching the disciples in Luke 6, 38. He told them, if you give, he didn't say if you pray. And he didn't say if you fast, that men were given to your bosom. He didn't say if you pray, men were given to your bosom. He didn't say if you study the word, men was going to give into your bosom. He didn't say if you go to church, men was going to give into your bosom. He didn't say if you start an intercessory team, men was going to give it to your bosom. He said if you give. If you give, it shall be given unto you. Now, here's what I want you to look at. The it shall be given unto you is an aspect that is hidden in the giving. So you might look at it and be like, well, you know, it shall go, it's going to be given to me. It's going to be given to me. But the only way you could know that is if you're giving. If you're not giving, it shall be given to you it is voided. You know what a voided check is? You can't cash that check. It's void. That means that there's no finances that you can pull from. No matter what somebody put on that check, they probably could have put $1 million on that check. But if it's void, you can't pull from it. Well, when you look at the void of it shall be given, you can't withdraw anything whether it be the good measure, the press down, the shake it together, or the running over. All those different regions of harvest are voided. It's, it's blocked off from you. You can't enter into it. Now, I want you, I, I want you to help me understand. <laughs> Somebody, could you help me understand how is it that the Lord began to teach them that they have to give in order for them to receive and this is the New Testament. So you understand that New Testament does not take away the law of giving. The New Testament doesn't take away the law of giving because the Lord is telling them in the New Testament, if you want to receive, it's not just because of uh, uh, me being merciful or me being gracious. All of your receiving is in you giving. There are things that you're supposed to receive, but you're not going to receive it until you give. Now, let me talk to you about this, um, this realm and this depth in the spirit, because it's really the glory realm. When you start sowing bigger seeds, you start unraveling bigger mail from God. I want you to hear me. The, the, the mail, the post office of God has prosperity gifts and packages for the seed sower. God has his own post office. When the mail comes in of your seed, when God looks at your seed, he doesn't just receive the mail in of your seed, he start mailing packages to you. The harvest is God sending you his mail. It's him sending you his offering. 
My goodness. The post office of the great God, Jehovah. You have to understand that prosperity angels are mailmen. The angel of abundant provision is a mailman. They deliver the mail of prosperity gifts. They bring the letters of good news to you. Debt cancellation. A change in your bodily health. You no longer have that disease no more. You no longer have that sickness, that illness no more. Your bloodstream has changed. They are male men, and they have a male route. Here's what's so mighty. The male route of the minister of finances, it happens to a select few because only a select few enter into the glory realm of sowing into God. I, I promise you, you go talk to the average woman, the average man. They'll tell you how much they love Jesus. Just ask them, well, how much do you sow? They can't tell you. So you, you telling me that you love Jesus so much? So if you talk to a parent and the parent telling you, I love my child so much, you're going to want to know, well, what are you doing towards your child? Do you feed them? you clothe them? Do you make sure that they have it? They, if a man come to you and say, I love my wife so much, you're going to want to know, well, well, how is he taking care of this woman? Is he making sure she's good? Or if a woman say, I love my husband so much, you want to know, well, what does, what does she do? How is she exemplifying that love? How does she exude that love, explain that love? There's people right now, they'll tell you how much, how long they've been saved. You don't want to know how, much, how long they've been saved. Because it's a delusion for most people. Ask them how long you've been sowing. You watch how they start to stutter. Uh, uh, what, what, do, what do you mean by that? You mean tithes and offering? Wait, 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 wait. I thought you told me you were saved. So you're telling me that in John 10.10, 10, the Lord gave us two revelations. He said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Okay, that's a part of you being saved. Then he said, the thief come but to steal, kill, and destroy. So you telling me that you've been saved, but you are still a thief. So where do I get into the notion of what you're flowing in in loving God? Because you already revealed to me that you don't give to him, nor do you have an understanding of giving to him and loving, loving it's attached to giving, and giving is attached to loving. God so loved the world that he gave. He, he so loved the world. He so, S-O-W as well, as, as S-O, I know it's S-O, but he so loved the world, so he sold the love. Then he gave materialistically. My goodness. He sold love psychologically then he gave love physically my goodness there's people that's telling you that they so love god psychologically but you can't find no documentation of them giving to god physically you can't tell me that you love god psychologically and then i can't find a track record of you giving to god financially that's impossible and many people are doing that. They'll tell you how much they love the Lord, how long they've been serving the Lord. Uh, okay, so all of this psychological talk about how your brain is so in love with him. Well, now show me the, the, the let's go from psychological into physical. Where's the physical manifestations of that love? Because the psychological, you can so love psychologically, but it births the realm of giving love Physically. What I'm teaching you is mighty. Because John 6, 3, uh, John 3, 16, you see God so loved the world. This is all psychological. That he gave. 
This is physical. The psychological love was there before you see the appearance of Jesus. But you're not going to not see the appearance of Jesus because the psychological love is authentic. Wow. I'm seeing something that I, 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 I myself, I'm amazed. Because as I'm saying this, the Holy Ghost, I'm, 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 I'm also a, a recipient of this word as I'm listening. It's ministering to my soul. Because now I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit say that the psychological love births the physical love. You meet people all the time that tell you that they are Christian, that they are sowing psychological love mentally unto God. But then you can't find no track record of physical financial love unto God, which validates, it verifies that the person does so love God psychologically. This is why the Holy Spirit gives a person wealth when they move in seed sowing. Because seed sowing is the manifestation of authentic psychological love. Because this is the route that God operated in to unlock the riches of the harvest that he wanted. And his harvest that he wanted was souls and sons. My goodness, my goodness, this apostolic. He wanted souls and sons. So when he sold, that was what he was naming his harvest. That whosoever will believe upon his seed will not perish but have everlasting life. To as many as receive his seed, he will give unto them the power to become the sons of God. He wanted souls and sons. And there, since Jesus, there have been so much souls and sons. Apostle Paul was a harvest of God's seed. If the father doesn't sow his best seed, Jesus, he doesn't reap Saul turning into Apostle Paul, apostolically doing signs and wonders and ministering to the Gentiles. So the harvest of God was even being manifested through the book of Acts. You notice the seed that God sowed went go talk to Apostle Paul through a bright light and said, I'm, I'm Jesus who you persecuted. My goodness. See, the seed going talks to a sinner. Man, come on, man. Y'all, y'all playing with me. You you playing with me tonight. I'm about to log off. <laughs> man, I feel the fire of God on me. I feel the fire of God on me. Did you hear what I just said? God's seed that he sowed went and confronted his enemy. And say, you persecuted me. You notice the father never said nothing to Apostle Paul. It was the seed that the father sowed. Jesus is telling him, I sanctified you to preach to, my, to, preach to the Gentile. See, the seed has a voice that deals with everybody that's connected to you. Now, I want, I want to shock you with this. Apostle Paul, who was a Saul, was the great God Jehovah's investor. But he was out of place. He was God's enemy. But God sold his best seed to reel Apostle Paul in. So the seed goes and talks to your investors even if they're currently your enemies. I hope you're catching what I'm telling you. 
Apostle Paul it was, was supposed to be an investor in the great God Jehovah's world. But what the great God Jehovah did to get Apostle Paul is sold his seed. Now Apostle Paul is, is, is being confronted by the sowing that the great God Jehovah did. And it's the seed that's talking to Apostle Paul. It's the seed that took away his appetite. My goodness, you're not talking to me. It's the seed that took away his eyesight, which means the eye that was taking in information from the God of this world. So you understand that the seed principle, it not only brings money cometh, it's holiness cometh. It's sanctification cometh. Because Apostle Paul couldn't look at nothing that he used to look at that was taking away his focus on the Lord. Nothing that was stopping him from becoming the image of God, what God wanted to see, all those things were broken by the seed. You not, see, see this, this apostolic teaching, like you can't even, you can't, man, see, that's what, my goodness, that's why if you listen, if you follow me, you bless. Everything that I teach is from the spirit. This ain't from, I didn't go listen to nobody's message. I didn't go pull up nobody's video. I didn't go listen to nobody's seminar. I ain't go to nobody's conference. This, what I'm talking to you is by the revelation of Jesus by the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you that in the word, it was the seed that gave Saul a transformation to become Paul. And even the father reeled in one of his major investors that was out of place by sowing his best seed. How much more when you sow your best seed, you reel in whoever is supposed to invest in you. Major investors are connected to the seed you sow. And that's why um, some of you all, the Holy Ghost, um, even though he has given you a knowledge about bountiful sowing, you sow bountifully into fake soil. So that when the Holy Ghost call on you to sow bountifully into rich and righteous soil, royal soil, that you done been wounded by fake soil, and you trying to convert your wounds to the instruction. Well, I remember what happened to me last time. I mean, what happened to me last time. Last time, baby, the Holy Ghost ain't tell you to sow nothing. You was sowing because you was connected to your sensuality. You was sowing because you was connected to your flesh. Flesh sowing will birth a wrong revelation about the seed. For you to sow through seed faith and not sow flesh seeds. See, seed faith versus flesh seeds. Seed faith, you in the will of God, sowing into who is the will of God for your life. Flesh seed you outside of the will of God. But you're trying to operate in the seed principle towards who's not even the will of God for your life. This brings soul wounds and scars. Because the end result of all these things is rejection and disappointment. You ain't talking to me. See, I never been wounded in sowing because I sow into my correct soul. You're not hearing me. No, you're not hearing me. I'm sowing into my correct soul for years now. 
So there's no defects in my sowing perspective. There's, there's no unclean spirits tampering with my seed revelation. Because cause I'm not sowing out of witchcraft. I don't got somebody holding no money line with me talking about, you know, no, no, you, 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 you got to pick that, you got to pick that $5,000 seed right now, right now, right now. You got 10 minutes to do it. Don't play with the anointing. See, some of you all have been molested in the seed principle. My goodness. And the molestation still has wounded you. So when you get touched by the seed word, you want to go pull from the memory of your molestation. Oh, no, no, no. Come on, man. Come on, man. Don't you, 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 you're not listening to what I'm telling you. You want to go back to your molestation. You're not being molested. This is divine intimacy that's scheduled. The Holy Ghost wants you to build an altar of bountiful sowing so that he could get you from one place to the next and lift you to the next place of financial returns. Sowing trauma. Sowing trauma can only happen if you're sowing into the wrong soul or you're sowing into the right soul with the wrong motive. Man. You, you want me to repeat it? Watch the replay. I said sowing is either where you're sowing into the wrong soul or you're sowing into the right soul with the wrong motive. With the wrong heart. Because motive and heart... Um, when I deal with motive, you, you, you can be uh, looking for something. But um, heart could be uh, even you missing the seed amount. God tell you to sow 500, you say, no, I'm going I'm to sow 300. God tell you to sow 200, you say, no, I'm just going to sow 50. And God could be telling you, I want you to sow 100, you say, no, I'm just going to sow 30. So when we deal with the wrong heart, you could be missing the exactness of what God wants. Remember, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, the Lord started telling Moses, tell the people to come bring me gold and silver and this and that. He was exact. He was saying what he wanted. So if they didn't bring God what he wanted, guess what? They saw him with the wrong heart because they not giving him what he asked for. They saw him with the wrong motive. You, you, can, you can have something in your mind and, and, and the thing that you have in your mind could be incorrect to what God is currently doing. And sometimes the thing is for later on. You, you know, let, let me show you this. Have you ever seen a child, they wanted to eat something sweet before the actual meal? They don't want to eat the food. They want to eat the sweets. And if you're a correct parent, you'll have to stop them from eating the sweets so that they could have their barely reserved to eat the food and then you reward them with sweets if you so will. But you notice that the child want the sweets first. Now, mind you, if you're going to give them the sweets, then it doesn't mean that the sweets wasn't scheduled. But the timing of the sweets cannot be dictated by the child. It has to be dictated by the parent because the child may want it before the meal when really you scheduled to give it to them after the meal, if you so will. Well, same way with the Lord. And sometimes you'll see things and you don't understand that sweetness that you're seeing is for after the meal. God going to feed you something else first. But then he going to give you that dessert later on. And there's a reason why God feeds you first, then give you dessert. Because people want dessert and they haven't been fed. So that means that they're mentally sick. 
The pleasure doesn't do you any well if you're mentally sick. The food comes to make you well so that when you get the pleasure, you can handle it and not sin against God and disrespect him with it. See, in the book of Genesis, you see the Lord giving them sweetness before the meal. They're in the Garden of Eden, naked, walking around, enjoying themselves. No worries, no fears, no nothing. They eat in whatever fruit they want, just having fun. All of the beasts of the field subject to them. They have sweetness. But see, they, in return, didn't value the sweetness. They picked another voice to dictate to them what they should do rather than be loyal to the voice that gave them sweetness. And that's what goes on with people when God gives you pleasure. You're not faithful to the way that he's giving you pleasure. You'll still go serve Satan and backslide and do what the hell you want. You don't have no loyalty. So what God does is he switched the narrative from Adam's day with the second Adam. Now God says, I'm the bread of life. Come eat of me first. You die to yourself. That's how you eat of me. You pick up your cross. That's how you eat of me. Then I give you the hundredfold, which is sweetness. Then I give you uh, lands and houses. That's what Mark chapter 10, verse 30 and on talk about. Not a hundredfold return. We're dealing with sweetness. Man, give it into your bosom. That's the sweetness. But you got to receive the bread of giving. You got to receive the bread of sacrificing money, things, possessions, when you have your own idea of how it should be circulated. But now you're yielding to the Holy Ghost to tell you how he wants to circulate it. And he's saying, afterwards, I'll give you the sweetness. Money coming, harvests, increase, prosperity, abundance, debt cancellation, health in your body, deliverance from your diseases restoration of your soul, divine connections and favors. See, I'm going to tell you something about the Holy Ghost. When he calling you to so big into him, he'll minister big to you, even through prophecy. He'll give you answers to what you've been looking for. And he, the, I'm going to tell you something about the Holy Ghost. He looks to see who, how you going to reward me for what I did for you. This is this a realm of the Holy Ghost that a lot of people don't know. But you, you can't talk to me and tell me that, hey, listen, you're just talking as an average preacher. You see the power that I move in. I know something. To activate that type of cocoon, to activate that type of portal of power, I know something. Apostolically, I know it. The Holy Ghost be looking to see how you going to reward me. I diligently sought you. Huh? I'm a rewarder of they that diligently seek me. But I diligently sought you. I told you secrets about your life. I told you secrets about your future. I ministered to you. So how you going to reward me? And some people be like, oh, praise God. He going to do this for me. Glory to God. And that's how, that's how they reward God. That's how they reward the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And then they go take their money and go buy meals and do what they want with it. Da, 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 da. You know, Holy Ghost like, ah. Huh. So that's how you reward me diligently seeking you. But you think that I'm going to reward you with money, with deliverance, with pleasures, with prosperity and provision and protection and safety. And here I'm giving you a chance to reward me. And you said no. You just want to speak mouth service. Let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. If all you give him is mouth service, all he'll give you is mouth service. If all you do is talk about promises and vows that you make up to him, he'll talk to you on the basis of promises and vows. You want manifestation, Holy Ghost? Manifest to the Holy Ghost. 
See, some of you all have been waiting for a move of God, but God been waiting for you to move. You want to stay in, in active mode. You want to stay in retirement, but you want God to keep on working miracles and working signs and wonders. But God, like, where you at? You notice Jesus had the power all along to feed the multitude. But he said, I need somebody to sow into me. Somebody give me something. I need to see, see faith. Not, oh, I believe. No, I don't want to hear somebody talk about, oh, my faith is in the power of God. I know he going to do it. Won't he do it? I don't want to hear that. I don't hear that from the Pharisees. I hear that from the Sadducees. I, I hear that from the, from the Nicolaitan seeds. I just made that one up, all right? Nicolaitan seeds. And Popeye the Sailor Man seeds. He said, I want somebody to give me a seed. Here come the young lad with five loaves and two fish. You notice when the lad come with five loaves and two fish, now here come Jesus saying, I'm going to release what I had all along. I just needed somebody to show me physical faith. If you take a note, remember this, that God gives you money as an opportunity to display physical and tangible faith. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Because, see, I think about it. I remember even when I was homeless and while I'm sowing, I'm not used to no homeless life. My mother sheltered me all my life. Now it's like I'm in a man zone. And I'm following the Holy Ghost. I got money. I could put the money into buying a place. But the Holy Ghost telling me to sow. He not forcing me. But his word is like fire shut up in my bones because we don't got no time to waste. I'm supposed to start JHM. I'm supposed to be releasing the healing power of God. I'm supposed to be doing conferences. I'm supposed to be releasing a certain image. Like, you see this shirt that I'm wearing? I could be wearing a shirt right now from Walmart. But the Holy Ghost want me to wear this Balenciaga shirt. I can't wear this shirt and look the way that the Holy Ghost want me to look if I ain't sewing. So I could come on here, bah, 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 bah. I could be on a, 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 a Kmart shirt. I could be in a Target shirt. No problem, right? But what I'm telling you, this is the image of God for how I'm supposed to be ministering right now. I was talking to some people in my team, and I was telling them there's an image of God to everything, even your weight. There's an anointing in your weight. Sometimes, uh, some of you all, uh, I'll be real raw with you, but hear me as an apostle, shut, shut, shut all your flesh up right now and hear me. Some of you all want to look ways that the Holy Ghost don't want you to look. You want to be extremely skinny and he don't want you skinny. You want to you wanna eat and drink and be, you, you just want to have and just, uh, just eat loose, no working out, no nothing. And the Holy Ghost don't want you like that. You get too fat. You get too out of shape. But see, you don't understand. There is power hidden in the image that God sees you being on July the 15th, on July the 22nd, on August the 3rd, on March the, the 15th, on, on October the, the, the 30th. There are days where God sees you a certain way. He sees your hair a certain way. Your goal should be, Holy Ghost, I want to look the way that you want me to look on the day that you schedule for me to look it. Many people don't think about this. You don't believe it? Esther is being trained by King Ahasuerus to smell a certain way, which means that on the day that she meets him, she's not supposed to smell a certain way. Or even look a certain way. Or even put her makeup on a certain way. She's being trained on the appearance of the image of God that is carrying the power. The same way.
Elisha is supposed to be bald head. So if he, if he has hair like this, Elisha is out of the image that's carrying the power of God. That's not the image that the Holy Ghost want to see in that vessel. He got his hair particles not growing right there. He's supposed to be bald. So even though the children come up talking about go up baldy, go up baldy, Elisha can release power. You know why? Because he's in the image of where he was supposed to be. He could curse them in the name of the Lord because the Lord with the name has seen his son looking the way that he wants him to look. There's authority there. Satan will have you looking like a fool in your image. You think that you look good, you don't look good. You think that you look bad and you don't look bad. Satan has dictated the image of man to man. Because they're not in the spirit. I ain't going to call no names because I ain't, and don't, no, don't nobody call nobody names on him. I ain't got no time for the dustiness. I know of somebody that's famous. They went go get butt surgery. They got, all, and, and, and then not only one, it was another person in their family and another person in their family. They went go get butt surgery. Big old, big old. Excuse the sound effect. When they got the big old butt surgery, years later, they all became skinny. Their butt looked like what? Their butt went from blow. To ow, 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 ow. And you see them walking around like this here. They walking around like this all proud. Just, you see them on TMZ. Yeah. Yeah, you looking at them like and you wondering, listen, but watch this here. Satan is talking in their mind and telling them to look like this, lose all this weight. They then became little skinny, 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 and their butt looked crazy, boy. Their butt will turn you into Zacharias. I don't know like, how we're going to have all these children. Black, he can't say nothing. Knock all them dentures out Zacharias had. Imagine Zacharias, his wife was asking him, you want some more food? Baby, are you tired? Are you, are you hungry right now? <laughs> you know, as Abraham there argued with Sarah when she told him to go have the child with, <laughs> with, with, with uh, 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 um, Hagar. He ain't argue with her, did it? Did it? That was the first time. You know, Abraham didn't say, hey, listen, lady, you know, I'm the husband. You follow me. She said, I think you should. Abraham said. (laughs) 
Abraham thought the prophecy was confirmation. <laughs> and it wasn't, you know. <laughs> uh, by the way, by the way, women are like that. Women will actually, women are tricky. Uh, dear son, let me help you out in the future um, or in the current. If a woman show you a picture of a woman and say, does this dress look good? You got to understand what angle she's asking you that question. So uh, it depends on what type of woman, what type of culture you're dealing with. Some woman will ask you if the woman look nice. The dress. But she'll ask you if the dress look nice. But she really asking you if the woman look nice. You got to hear what she saying, my brothers and sisters, even though she not saying it. You got to hear what she is saying that's unsaid. Because cause some men be like, oh, yeah, this dress look real nice. Oh, yeah, baby, you got to get this one. Oh, yeah. Could you send me that picture? Could you send me that picture? I already sent it to you. What you mean? Oh, I oh I just didn't check my message yet. That's all. That's all. But you gotta send me that picture. You, yeah. Can I see that dress again? Yeah. Oh yeah. You definitely gotta wear that. That look bad on you, girl. Yeah, yeah. That look, that look real nice on you, girl. <laughs> now you need to get that dress, girl. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Can I see the back on that dress? Uh huh. That back. Okay. That's how. The, oh, that's that's what she working with. All right, yeah, yeah, you look even 10 times better, but she working with, but yeah, yeah, you got to get that dress. How much it cost? Yeah, it cost, yeah, it cost, about, all, all right, look, can I see the picture again? Send it to me, yeah. All right, all right, turn around. Okay, okay, all right, right there, all right, all right, see, oh, what she, how tall is she, though? How tall is she? Yeah, you, yeah, you, you kind of tall, you about. Not, now you kind of short. She kind of tall in this. She kind of short. You kind of short in this picture, but she, she kind of, she you you, she tall in the picture, but you, you short. You short. Yeah, I think I think I think it, 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 she looked real good, but I don't, but I don't know what you being short. Mm. Like look like you got on a, a pilgrimage dress, like you. Like your name Emily in a thriller movie or something. Like your name Sarah in a thriller movie, like a like a horror, thriller horror. <laughs> you gotta hear what a woman is saying that's unsaid. She'll come tell you, oh, does this look good? And you're like, yeah, ooh, this look real good. And meanwhile, she over there looking at you like, oh, what this look? Well, you mean she look good? Oh, yeah, this look real good. Look, look at this here. Look at this. Could you could you show me the picture next? Oh, yeah, this look real nice on you. Mm-hmm. This look real nice on you. Uh-huh. Okay, I see the picture though. I want to see the picture again, huh? Yeah, it look real nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and she asking you a question. You like the dress? The, 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 how does the dress look? Oh, oh, this dress is banging. Bros, this is banging. I, I, think, I think we should get it. Now, think about it. Satan go play with that woman's mind later on and tell her, see, he, he, see, he, he looking at that woman. He think that woman cute. You could be engrafted into the dress and how it's going to look on her. But she might be seeing, and then the serpent come. See, he, see, he don't, see, that's, 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 see, I told you, when he was having that fit earlier, he don't want you. I, I told you, didn't I tell you? I told you that he don't want you. You see how he was studying the picture? He was studying the dress. He was studying the Big Back Wednesdays. That was going on in the picture. All right. The thunderclap Thursdays that was going on in the picture. He was studying all of that. <laughs> and all throughout 
all throughout the picture. You notice he wasn't even studying the picture. He was studying her. And, and meanwhile, let me finish now. Let me finish now. Meanwhile, the serpent now is tormenting that woman. Now, mind you, it was her that asked the question. <laughs> it was her that <laughs> asked the question. It was her that brought the picture. But the serpent even knows, okay, I'm going to pitch something in your idea system that's going to affect you. Satan will have you think something, and the thing is to create a mental warfare for you. When you say it, it brings you somewhere. But see, that was just chronicles. I was just telling you, sons in here, women don't always say what they're saying. If a woman, if you ask a woman, are you okay? And she say, yeah, I'm good. That means that she going crazy inside. She having a fit. She done had 50 conversations that you are unaware of. 100 conversations that you don't even know about. 2,000 conversations that you have no idea what's going on. Since the beginning of time, the serpent always goes to the psychological state of a woman and plays games with that woman so that she won't make it to her destiny or she'll leave her destiny. Either one. I say, you're not hearing me in here. From the beginning of time, Satan has always gone to the psychological state of a woman to talk to her to either bring her, keep her out of her destiny or take her from her destiny when she arrives. And you can't find a woman that doesn't believe Satan after some time. Because all the serpent does is uses time and space to continue to plow the psychological brain of a woman until emotionally she has no resistance but to receive and entertain and embrace the lies. Before she knows it, she was supposed to be in Minnesota. She over in Kansas City try, trying to start a new business. Before she knows it, she was supposed to be over here in Africa. She all the way in Europe, talking about God, God going to make a way for me here. She over in Europe. The angel's over there scratch her head like, Lord, didn't you say you told her Africa, right? We just, it's Africa, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. She over there in Europe. We'll just hold off. We can't do no ministry. We'll just hold off until she get back to Africa. Because Europe was where you said for us to minister all these things to her. We can't minister none of these things to her because she over here in Africa. There are decisions that you're called to make as a woman, and if you don't make the decisions, you're going to suffer financially. You got to understand, some of you women are more powerful than you know. That's why you're not moving in the power that you're supposed to know. You're more powerful than you know. That's why you're not moving in the power that you're supposed to know. You're supposed to know this power, but it's foreign to you. You have the power of patience, the power of perseverance, the power of, uh, of peace, the power of power. You know what the power of power is? The power of power, it means that this is the realm where you act out the realm. Let me explain this slower. So let me show you this. So Esther is in the power of power. She's in the realm of queen. But she's acting out the power to eliminate Haman. My goodness. This is the power of power. She's in the realm. It's power. The realm is power. But of power, she's operating in her powers of, in that power. So now Haman is dead. The children of Israel is preserved. 
She's operating in the power of power. The realm, but also the releases. The seat and the supplies. Oh, you're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. The seat and the supplies. The power of power. Office. The offerings. The seat. The supplies. The position. The production. The power of power. So Mary Magdalene is in the power of power. The seat. The supplies. The power is we see her in the apostleship. We see her in the discipleship. But the releasing of the power, Jesus telling her to go tell Peter to meet him. After the resurrection, we're seeing the power of power. Many women don't even understand the power of power. You say you're a woman of God, but do you understand the releases of God operating you in you as a woman? You say you're a woman of God, but the, but the God that you say that you're of, he has powers that he wants to release to you in your attitude, in your gratitude, in your skills, and in your wills. Or let me say your will, your skills and your will. Your mind and your movement. Your position and your production. I think some of y'all going to have to watch the replay to understand the depths of what I'm talking about. Because I'm giving you something. Heavier than a 600 pound life. I'm giving you something heavy, heavy. From this moment forward. I'll never lack. Be sick. Or be deceived by the powers of darkness. In Jesus' name. I walk in supernatural provision and supernatural vision. Ministering spirits go forth and minister for me and cause the money to come to me in Jesus' name. I receive open windows and doors. I receive a fresh sowing anointing and a fresh reaping anointing. And I'll sow and I'll reap and I'll inherit all things. I'll build my altar. And all my seed is going to multiply to the degree I'll see and taste that the Lord is good. I'll eat the good of the land. And I'll have so much wealth it'll be for my children's children. Which means that my wealth will last generations. I take a hold of the blessing of Abraham. I take a hold of the blessing of Prophet Joshua Holmes. 